Seems like this microphone is working. Uh, good morning and uh, welcome to the Issues of Immigration and Criminal Justice Conference uh, hosted by John Jay Center on Race, Crime and Justice. Um, I'm Dan Stageman. I'm the co-chair of the conference along with Shirley Leiro, who is in the back. Hello, Shirley. Um, the theme of today's conference is the criminalization of immigrants in justice, policy, and practice. So we are lucky to have as our keynote speaker the woman who is arguably the foremost expert on this subject in the nation, uh, Dr. Dora Schreiro, Commissioner of the New York City Department of Corrections, a uh, post to which uh, she was appointed by Michael Bloomberg, Mayor Michael Bloomberg, in 2009. Uh, the New York City Department of Corrections is the fourth correctional system that Dr. Shriro has operated, has run after, in reverse chronological order, the Arizona State System, the Missouri State System, and the St. Louis City System. In Arizona and Missouri, Dr. Shriro was the first woman selected to run those systems. Uh, but most important to our subject today was Dr. Shriro's position just before coming to New York. Uh, as Special Advisor to Secretary of Homeland Security Janet Napolitano on Immigration and Customs Enforcement and Detention and Removal. In that role, Dr. Shriro wrote the definitive report on the extent to which the ostensibly civil immigrant detention system had begun to rely on a criminal justice system model and on prison infrastructure for its operations. Uh, that Dr. Schreiro was able to author and release to the public this report from within the Department of Homeland Security speaks to her dual commitments as both a correctional administrator of unparalleled competence and a tireless advocate for the rights and well-being of the individuals caught up in these systems. Please welcome Dr. Dora Schreiro. What a nice introduction. Thank you, Dan. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Wake up. We have real work to do. Um, I can't tell you how excited I have been looking forward to today and this morning's opportunity to continue to think out loud with you. I'll do my best to save a little time so perhaps we can do a bit of Q&A before you go off to uh, the rest of the day's very important conversations. So I, I want to think out loud with you. Uh, I want to envision with you what a civil system of civil detention might be, uh, and to share with you some of the things that I discovered as I traveled the country toward 25 facilities, some of them more than once, uh, spoke to many, many people in and out of government, read ever so many reports authored in and out of government, uh, and met with members of Congress and many other important stakeholders. One of the things that struck me uh, very early on is that there was striking similarity uh, in, in many of the observations and those early findings. And in an area as controversial as this has been, I thought, well, that's pretty interesting. And by that, I mean inside of government, whether it was OMB or, or reports even authored by uh, the IG at DHS, Department of Homeland Security, or by the advocacy community, uh, many of the same findings were being found. And that doesn't happen all that often. And yet, still today, there is some considerable controversy about whether civil detention ought to be different from criminal detention, and to what extent, in what ways, that might be. And some other things that I'm going to touch on. So what I'd like to do in, uh, towards the end of the conversation is to, is to wrap up by reflecting on some of the more recent uh, improvements that have been, um, been uh, um, provided through um, ICE, um, particularly the recent release of 2011 standards and now the, um, the opening of the first several facilities uh, in a model that's, that's different than the one that was uh, has been used uh, previously and historically. So let's see what we can do in the next hour together. Um, as uh, Dan had, had mentioned, um, so much of the good in my life has really come through my affiliation with Janet Napolitano. Um, first, uh, when I served as director of the Arizona Department of Corrections and the kinds of reforms that I was able to accomplish there because of the support that I received from 
her in her executive capacity, and then having the extraordinary opportunity to be tapped to go to DC with her as first senior advisor and then as the first director of the Office of Detention Policy and Planning uh, within ICE, the place from which the report was authored and released. And when you think about it, how often in government are you, are you specifically invited to government with the purpose of figuring out what wasn't working well, what could work better, and then write it up so as to tell the whole world what you found and what you thought could be done about it. That's a, that's a rare gift, and I thank her uh, to this very day for that opportunity. Now my charge, um, both in the position that I had as well as the work that I did, was to focus on the significant growth in immigrant detention and the rest priorities at ICE. And then fundamentally to really to think about and, and identify the ways in which the interactions between ICE and aliens, how's that for a benign restatement, um, um, could be um, re-envisioned and, uh, and uh, re reactualized. Um, and, and so what I did, as I said, was to go around the country and talk to all these many people with very divergent points of views. Every place that I went, um, I called ahead to everyone I could identify on all sides of the issues to meet with as many of the different stakeholders as I could. And when I went to the facilities, to, to walk through them as I would a, in my prior capacities as either uh, warden or as, as, uh, as the head of those organizations. So I went through the kitchens, I checked the menus, I checked the temperatures of food, I walked into the food coolers, you know, I went to the laundries, I checked everything from um, pest control to, um, to linen exchange. And of course, along the way, I talked to ever so many of the detainees and uh, as many of the, the staff, both the ICE personnel who may be assigned to those facilities, as well as to the public and private um, providers, uh, the, the, the jailers, if you will, who ran those facilities. It is important to note that ICE is the largest system of incarceration in the United States. That needs to be repeated. ICE is the largest system of incarceration in the United States, bigger than the Bureau of Prisons, larger than, uh, than the Texas state system, larger than the California system. Uh, it is the biggest, and, you know, and even to this day, it is not a particularly well-known, well-understood um, system, and that, of course, was my fund fundamental charge to, uh, to understand who it was, what it was, how it operated, and to document that, and then to make the recommendations for, for reform. Now, I, I, of course, I approached my work as a jailer, because that's who I am, a jailer. Um, someone who's been dedicated to the field of corrections throughout my career. Um, but in addition to being a jailer, some of the skills that I have that informed this inquiry, just as they inform every inquiry when I go into a correctional system and look for opportunities to improve it as well, is to take something of an ethnographic approach. So I walk in, try to empty my head out, and be there with as few, if any, preconceived notions as possible, and just see what what that place says to me, to listen to what those people say to me, to look to see what the information says to me, and, uh, and then to dig deeper and deeper. Um, but not only am I trained as a, as a correction professional and previously um, coming into corrections through sociology and so through the <coughs> discipline of ethnography, I say that for those of you who might benefit from that here at John Jay and your various student uh, capacities, um, but I'm also an, um, I've uh, gone to law school. I'm, I stopped short of saying I'm an attorney because um, I don't practice law, um, but having you know the the legal training as well. And so I also want to know, uh, as a jailer and in this case um, as a senior policy advisor, is what does the law say? You know, what are the minimum requirements when it comes to uh, the interaction of of government? and aliens in its custody. And unlike the correction law, which has become fairly robust over the last 40 years, there's very little in the law to guide 
the operation of civil detention facilities, but what little there is is particularly instructive because what, it, what, the, what the Supreme Court in particular has said loud and clear is that civil detention, unlike criminal detention or criminal incarceration of any sort, is expressly not for the purpose of holding individuals on criminal charges. It is sole purpose is an administrative purpose to hold individuals pending the determination for concerning relief or removal. It is expressly not for the purpose of punishment. And that's particularly striking um, because up to now, virtually all but one or two of the 300 plus facilities that have been utilized by ICE were designed and operated primarily as jails and to a lesser extent as prisons. And not surprisingly, there's been terrific um, confusion in the general public, you know, in part perhaps because of that kind of physical plant backdrop about what were the real differences, were the real differences between the civilly detained and the criminally incarcerated. And, uh, and so, as I went around and as I talked to all these people and, and started to sort the information that I was collecting into categories, and I'm gonna tell you about those seven buckets in a moment, um, it became increasingly clear to me that this report needed to be clear, it needed to be complete, but perhaps most importantly, that it ought not to be a criticism, but a springboard for conversation so that we as a community, we, all of us as the constituency, could determine for ourselves, um, guided by the law and guided by whatever good evidence there was in similar fields, but not the same, such as the field of corrections, you know, what civil detention um, ought to be and how quickly we could get there. So um, I, I wanna share for a moment these, these seven buckets because it in it informs a latter part of this discussion, which is not only what it is that, that needs to be done, but how, how it is actually that we go about getting it done. So the observations um, are somewhat guided again by the field of corrections, but with the clear understanding that, that although it's a frame of reference, it is not the definitive frame of reference um, nor is it the exclusive frame of reference, but to the extent that it makes sense, let's do something with it. So population management is, uh, is important to this conversation as it is in other kinds of institutions because population management really lays out both the continuum and the conditions of the kind of control from least, as in none, to the most restrictive forms uh, of managing individuals. And so in that continuum are also alternatives to detention, again, starting with no supervision, continuing through various degrees of community supervision, and then extending all the way through to the most extreme forms of incapacitation. Um, which I have argued from, from a variety of evidence-based um, principles should be reserved for only that relatively small segment of the alien population that is evidenced to have high propensity for risk if they're incarcerated or civilly detained. Likewise, if they evidence a high risk of failure to appear if they're placed in the community. Population management is gonna be really important also when we reflect on some of the more recent reforms, such as the several new facilities that are, are soon to open. In the report, I break out and talk about, in much greater detail, alternatives to detention simply because it is also its own discipline and is, is widely misunderstood and warranted some additional tension. So in essence, population management became the first two of the seven buckets that I've, that I've been referencing. Detention management is equally important, 
this is where you start to narrow your focus um, once the decision is made either to provide supervision in the community or to place an individual in a secure setting. And again, um, just what are those core operating assumptions that impact the daily conditions of supervision if they're out in the street or the daily conditions of detention if they're in a facility? And that's certainly been in the paper when they're talking about CARNs and some of the others. Programs management is the, is the next or the fourth of the uh, important things to be considering. And, deten and sorry, programs management includes most importantly health care. But again, health care like alternatives to detention is such a huge area and, and is it, its own discipline and has its own case law. It was broken out as, as yet a separate section. But before I go back to, well, I'll finish with health law and I'll go back to the programs. One of the most important things, perhaps the most important thing to say about health care is that it is a fundamental right. And, and even today in the discussions, um, there, there is considerable debate as to what kinds of health care ought to be provided to the civilly detained population uh, and at what point and under what circumstances. And so perhaps we'll touch on that some more. Health care, of course, at the minimum includes both medical care, mental health care, and dental care. The other kinds of programs, and this largely borrows from the field of correction, so it sets a minimum platform, but that doesn't mean that that should, that should bind us in the discussion about civil detention as to whether or not that minimum is, is yet adequate for a wholly different population. That it, it speaks to religious health care, and there's federal law that governs that. Uh, with dealing with all um, institutionalized, that is, placed in public holding type facilities. Um, and it also speaks to recreational um, uh, necess necess necessities, as well as what I call access to the court, which is in the, in the most narrow sense, uh, law library. And in this case, it would not be to access to criminal law library reference materials, but to civil uh, reference materials and also includes, I see our own here from, uh, from the Beer Institute, it, it, it includes important innovations such as the legal orientation program, um, which helps to fast track the alien population to know more about what their, what their rights are, limited as they are when it comes to uh, relief. It also involves as a program access to family. And so in the narrow sense, that's visitation but it also includes access by phone, by, by regular U.S. Postal Service mail, and now increasingly by, mean, uh, by email, and that's, that's a happy uh, addition. Um, there, there's also, as the six of the seven buckets, what I refer to as special populations. And what this really speaks to is taking all of the other important big categories that I've described population management, detention management, programs management, and tailoring each of those mandates to meet the needs of, more unique needs of special populations. So you have girls and women, for example, you have families with minor children, you have the ill and the infirm, you have the elderly, uh, non-criminal asylum seekers, uh, as, as several of the examples of special populations for which all the other things need to be tailored. And perhaps from my perspective, the most important, and that's accountability. That's really about government's commitments to itself, government's commit to, commitment to one another, that in all things that it have the policies, the processes, so as to be transparent, so as to be accountable and to be accountable by having identifiable goals and objectives and measurements, uh, and then the posting, the regular publication of those, um, of those measurements um, as one continues to progress to make the system better. Now, there, there are a couple things that um, 
as I've continued to reflect on the, the work that I did at ICE um, that are reflected in some of my more um, recent writings um, on how to make change happen. And, um, and it really speaks to the, the, the part of the report where I, took ex where I took exceptional pains to describe how ICE did its work, at least in 2009, the, the time that I was, I was there and, and know it best to, to speak about it. And um, the, the system has been, uh, and I think largely continues to be, a largely decentralized system. So there are 24 field offices throughout the United States, and each of the field offices is headed by um, what internally is referred to as a FOD. Not sure I'd want to be called a FOD, um, but it's a field office director. Bad, bad attempt at a joke, I apologize. And come on, wake up, wake up. <laughs> All right. So, um, so many of the decisions are, are um, diffused, decentralized to the field office level. And I think some of the difficulties that we see and, and the concerns that the advocacy communities have expressed have a lot to do with the way in which ICE has been organized. And you know, in, in, in a context, you can understand it. There was this extraordinary growth in, um, in civil detention, and it came about with this singular shift in policy, which went from, as you know it well, all too well, from catch and release to catch and remove. And that singular change in policy um, triggered this extraordinary demand for lots of beds very fast. And so this rapid growth uh, that occurred within ICE, and now we're, you know, we're clearly at a point where that all needs to be revisited and, and appreciably revamped. And so a lot of the report was spent looking at how it was and how it could be restructured so as to achieve better results. So the way it works is each of the, of, the, of the field office directors was responsible for procuring sufficient beds in their area to meet the demand of the apprehensions that were engaged in that part of the country. But because, um, um, for a variety of reasons, those beds were not necessarily available, but there were lots of beds and lots of vendors all too happy to provide those beds, in other places where, where land was cheap and labor was cheap uh, and regulations perhaps were far less um, limiting, um, there was this explosion of capacity in places that did not align with, um, with where the apprehensions were occurring. And in my report, there are, I think, some very useful maps where you could see um, where demand was, where capacity was, and guess what? You know, where you're short on beds, people get moved, and they got moved, you know, many states away, appreciable miles away, and that had all sorts of other ramifications which um, impacted uh, the delivery of day-to-day -day services throughout their detention and very likely impacted some of the re removal decisions where they had counsel before and then were separated from counsel, went to other places where pro bono um, care was, uh, was appreciably limited and so on. So I spent a lot of time really looking at the organization, and many of the recommendations really reflected that, like actually having a list of all the facilities and knowing what their, their physical capacities were, but also, as a practical matter, what were they really built and staffed to do? You know, did they have a medical facility? Could they accommodate uh, an, an alien who had come into ISIS custody? Uh, and what, what did ICE need to know about an individual so that it could make an informed decision, first, whether or not they needed to be detained or could be placed in some community uh, capacity, and then where was the appropriate place to detain them. And, um, and because of the, the decentralization, some of the practices that occur in corrections were missing. So again, I'm not suggesting by any means that ICE be set up to, to look like corrections, but if you're going to build, to borrow from one discipline to another, you need to understand the principles upon which that discipline corrections is predicated so that you don't miss important steps along the way. And so in the field of corrections, for example, 
the first thing that we do in any jail or prison system is to assess the individual. You assess them for their propensity for violence because you want to place individuals with others who are similarly situated so you don't put a person who has no violent tendencies in a facility or in a housing unit where they will be with other individuals who do have violent tendencies. Likewise, you want to know what the person's medical needs are and not place them in a facility that, that can't meet those needs. And so these are some of the things that we do you know, fundamentally right up, right up front in the corrections arena. But in ICE, it, it, there's, well, there's no, I'll just say it simply, if, if, if every bed is considered a bed and every person is considered a body and it's just a matter of putting bodies into beds, um, then, then you're going to have difficulties and indeed all the difficulties that have been chronicled both by government and others, you know, go back to some of those fundamental lack of understandings about how it is that corrections does what it does. Um, and I'm going to speak about that in a moment because that relates directly to standards and what is the, how, how much can you expect standards to do for you as you go through um, the, the kinds of um, reforms that we as a country are going through right now. So there were, there were, as I stepped back with a little bit of time and some additional perspective and thought about, um, okay, so we've got this, you know, these seven buckets, seven areas where appreciable improvements can be made where there has been commitment to make them. What do you fundamentally need to make sure that that happens? So we're all clear we want to make change happen. We're not so clear exactly what change we want to have happen because that's clearly the debate that continues in this country today. But what's necessary? What do you have to have uh, as that agreement comes about or even until it comes about and you're still making reforms? And so I want to suggest that um, that there are three things that is ever so important to keep in our minds as we go forward. And the first is what I call capacity. And, and that goes back to the, the analytics that I've been describing about how ICE had been organized to, to do its work. Capacity is fundamentally the organization's infrastructure. It's its written uh, instruction, the policies, the procedures, even the post orders. You know, what is every person who's assigned that facility supposed to do so that when every person does their job, the big J job gets done, that the facility runs as well as you would, would want it to as, as well as law, the law requires that we do. But the, the capacity speaks not just to the written instruction, it also speaks to the physical plant and this, of course, is a conversation now about Carnes and some of the others. So the physical plant, is, as I have come to see it in all the work that I've done over the years uh, in the field of corrections and, the, and more broadly in systems reforms, is that the physical plant is fundamentally the plan for making the change. And so if the physical plant is congruent with the changes that you hope to accomplish, the work gets done ever so you know, ever so more easily and, and well. It's more efficient and it's more effective. If the physical plant is not congruent with the underlying assumptions, then you're going to have a disconnect from the get-go. And at best, you're going to have to work much, much harder and spend much more money to get a similar result, but not necessarily ever get the res desired result. And then there's also personnel that are, that are part of the capacity. And the personnel, again, has to be the right number in the right places with the right kinds of credentials, with the right attitude, so as to do the work that needs to be done. The, the second of, the, of the, the big things that I think really is critical to making change happen speaks to competency. Those are fighting words, right? Competence, competency. Really talking about the performance um, of the organization and all of the components of the organization. Um, and so it's, 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 a, it's an outcome conversation. It is to what extent, with what regularity, does an organization achieve its stated goals with the greatest amount of efficiency and effectiveness? 
because you know throughout the report and the conversation that have followed, there's been a lot of conversation as well about how expensive civil detention is, and the you know the the per diem cost of of the daily bed versus the cost of uh, of community supervision versus the cost of not needing to do anything at all and making that choice um, when, it's, when it's warranted. So competency is a conversation about performance. It's a conversation about focusing on outcomes much more so than outputs. Did, you, did we achieve the desired results? How quickly did we receive, achieve them? And are we able to sustain the improvements that we sought to sustain? <laughs> Performance and competency, it's also a conversation about innovation. Is this a place, is, 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 this, is this part of government a safe place to experiment? Maybe sometimes to make mistakes, but to see mistakes even as opportunities for improvement so as to continue to pursue good information, build a, bo build a body of good knowledge, good science, so as to continue to move the reforms forward. Performance competency is fundamentally a conversation about being proactive, about being ready, willing, and able to find and fix the root causes of reoccurring situations that continue to vex us and, and plague the reforms that are underway. So said yet another way, competency is really um, a conversation about our ability as a society, as, 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 a, as a community, to achieve and sustain measurable results that will transform, transform the field. The last of the three important things for consideration is commitment. Commitment. And as I started my conversation with you today, you know, clearly the commitment by the secretary to, to recognize that things were not going well, to not run away from it, but to run toward it, to understand it better, to write a report that remains on the DHS website to this day as a reminder about the work still to be done, as well as to celebrate the milestones that have been reached. Commitment is a conversation in which we also share responsibility and have a role. Your active participation today here at John Jay is one way that you evidence this commitment, that John Jay holds this conversation is yet another measure. Commitment is all about constituency, and there are many constituents in the conversation to civil detention and, and all of its permutations. I, I'm always afraid that I'm going to leave out the community supervision part of this because it's much bigger than detention. Really talking about how do you maintain oversight of individuals pending the determination about removal or relief. And so constituency commitment is really a conversation about all of us, not only the rights still somewhat limited when it comes to uh, individuals who are caught up in the system, but our rights and our responsibilities as members of this constituency to be committed to this conversation through all of its successes and failures to the very end. So let's just take a couple minutes and, um, and reflect on um, how much change um, ought there be, how much change can there be, and even if things are changed, are they any better? So I guess asking it another way is, so what does a win look like? Right? How do we know when we got there? So um, let's start with a couple of the easier ones first. Um, so we have these um, several new civil detention facilities that um, are about to open. And there's clearly been um, conversation with advocates and others uh, about um, their design, 
um, and their operation. And, uh, and yet, by early news reports, there's still some considerable controversy. You know, it's a little bit the Goldilocks, you know? Is it too hot, is it too cold, or is it just right? So what does just right look like? Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna tease out some of the easier parts, though, I think, to maybe move that conversation along. Um, there, there is some confusion in the conversation, I think, or some lack of clarity, maybe is a better way to say it, between um, the kinds of risk um, that we're talking about. The decision, once the decision is made to apprehend an individual, to have determined that they may have viol violated uh, uh, immigration law, and that they may be subject to removal. There are at least two questions in the correctional arena that need to be asked. And sometimes in the newspaper accounts that I'm seeing, the question is, yeah, you know, they're, they're nicer facilities than they were before, but there shouldn't be any facilities at all. Everyone should be in the community. And um, uh, as a matter of law, you know, which is, at least when it comes to statutory law, so you're talking policy as promulgated by Congress in this case, there is a very large number of people pursuant to the immigration reforms of the 1990s that are specifically identified as mandatory detention. And so until and unless federal law is modified, there will always be a considerable number of people who, as a matter of law, must be mandatorily detained. And so community supervision, it, depending on which of those subcategories you're talking about in the statute, is either for a period of time going to be off the table or always going to be off the table. Um, and so it's important, again, to remember that continuum, which is where I started the conversation. You know, that continuum of control from least, i.e., no supervision, up through the most rigorous forms of um, detention. And so for those who are eligible as a matter of law to be considered for something other than detention, then what are the good questions to ask to get you there? And so in the field of corrections, there's a, there are different variations, but there's basically the question is, what is the probability of your failure to appear for all of your scheduled uh, uh, or required appearances up to and including the, the day you're supposed to report to actually be removed physically from the country? Now, there are scientific instruments that can, can they never 100% predict but they can help us to identify uh, who's appropriate for, for placement in the community and then what the level of supervision ought to be in the community, the least amount necessary so as to achieve the desired result, to afford them maximum freedom while they're still at liberty, but also to assure that they will report as required as a matter of law. In the, in the, the secure facility, the question is different. The question there, as I was suggesting before, is what is that individual's propensity for violence? Because again, the fundamental responsibility is to ensure that no harm occurs for the duration of the time that you're in a facility. And again, to have assessment instruments to make those good decisions to decide who's appropriate to be in the kind of more recently envisioned facilities where there's greater freedom of movement uh, uh, a more normalized setting and things of that sort. But I want to I want to suggest to you, and I'm going to come back to this, that that to the extent that ICE was predicated on is, and is still virtually wholly dependent on the correctional model to the extent that it adheres to it, and I've already pointed out some of the gaps where those those practices are simply missing. That, that corrections is predicated on command and control. That correctional facilities are total institutions, for those of you who are sociology students, you know, that are based on some pretty um, 
um, simple premises, um, the first of which is that the population is there involuntarily. And one could argue that that's the same for those who are civilly detained. But there are also appreciable differences, as I have come to know it, uh, amongst the majority of individuals who are civilly detained from those who are criminally incarcerated. And that is, um, I think, to the, to the heart of some of the debate. And so perhaps this little piece of the conversation might just move us along some. The vast majority of individuals, individuals that I have met who are civilly detained um, were uh, involved actively in intact families that they held jobs, that many of them were um, prof professionals um, in their home country and even in this country, that a number are highly credentialed in different disciplines. And, um, and so when we think about where, where um, facilities must be, if nothing else as a matter, because of a matter of law, because of the mandatory detention requirements, how would you reorganize, how would you re-envision a facility for people who know how to take care of themselves, who, for people who have demonstrated that they can take care of themselves? So when you talk about normalizing, you know, that's, that's a very, that's, that takes you in a very different direction when you're talking about these groups of individuals than other groups who are in criminal systems, many of whom do not come from intact families, many of whom um, have not achieved basic literacy and employability school, uh, skills, the majority of whom ha have uh, no or, or lack of viable employment history at all, a population who is largely engaged in drugs and alcohol, all the, make all your criminology stuff kick in and you can fill in the blanks, right? And, and so the way in which you would envision a facility and the way that you would um, build a facility and staff a facility and the kinds of choices that you would integrate into a facility for those who are civilly detained clearly can be, and I would argue then should be, different. You know, where people who have always taken care of themselves, you know, can be provided with washers and dryers and keep their own clothes and then launder their own clothes and take care of their own, of their own personal possessions. For individuals who know how to prepare meals and, uh, and meals are critical to maintaining an intact family, you know, that they could be provided with basic grocery staples in a common kitchen and, and fix food for themselves or their, or their families to give them as much control, as much autonomy over their own lives and still achieve the core governmental functions are things that I think greater consideration needs to be given to. And so giving ourselves permission to step back from command and control and you fill in the blanks what we're going to call it is maybe a way to get that conversation going. The other thing that strikes me when we in, in the literature recently about um, nicer jails but still jails or no jails at all is that, that there's still this over-reliance on um, external means of controlling. And again, for, for, for many in this population with strong family ties, strong community ties here in the United States, even if there's, if there's a risk of failure to appear, I think it articulates differently than with the criminal population who doesn't evidence in the same way lack of commitment to uh, the, their commitment to family. And, um, and so, so that's a little bit of my musings about uh, the, new f the new facilities that are coming about. And then uh, just to, to wrap up and then turn to you, um, the 2011, they call them PBNDS, always makes me think of a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, but I guess it isn't. Um, another bad effort at a joke, come on, give me a hand here, um, is the standards. So let's talk a little bit about standards. Um, there's, there's clearly um, uh, quite a bit of reliance, quite a bit of hope that's associated with promulgating standards, publishing standards, and then every bit as importantly actually ensuring that all of the facilities, no matter how they look, you know, new or, or as they are, 
that those facilities will actually adhere to the standards. And there's also been considerable press in the past to, um, to codify those standards, to, to make them law so as to achieve greater leverage for compliance when there is lack of compliance. And so let's just do a little bit of ghost busting about that um, as well uh, as you start your day. So about the standards, again, what are, what are they predicated on? Um, well, the standards that we know now and their earlier iterations are all based on the American Correctional Association's standards for pretrial prisoners. So again, these are premised on the principle of command and control. They are premised on a criminal population with considerable case law, but also different case law. That the reason that you are held in a jail, like our jails here in New York City, is because you have been charged with one or more crimes and that you are being held because it's been determined that your risk of failure to appear is, is great or you're otherwise ineligible to be considered for bail or can't make your bail. And so you're in a facility, but you're in the facility for the express purpose of going to trial or deliberating a plea or pending sentencing. And then for the very small number who get short sentences, you're actually in jail to serve that sentence for the, for the crimes that you pled to or were found guilty to. So you, you've got standards, again, that are, that are based on command and control. But these standards are also premised because they were developed for correctional systems, that is, correctional systems like the NYC DOC, that I think for the large part has successfully addressed the issues of capacity, of competency, and commitment that is not yet wholly evident in the ICE community. And so whether or not there's the infrastructure to actually execute the standards, the 2011 now, remains to be seen. And so then you talk to the, so then what is the leverage where there is failure to comply? And what is, what is again, the, the commitment uh, within government for those facilities that don't comply? There's also been debate when it comes to the standards, um, when it comes to the codification, um, that, um, that that would give you the, the leverage for enforcement. There's a flip side to that, and I just want to throw that out there as well. It's really difficult to, to create law. And so once it's created, it's every bit as difficult, usually more difficult, to change it. But we're in a discipline, whether you're on the correctional side, but clearly on, on, the, on the civil side, where the information is very new and the science is still fairly limited. And so to, to argue for standards that are extremely detailed and then codified and then more good information comes along, additional science that would inform and shape and maybe change those things that are now in law means that in a, unintentionally you get frozen in time. And so that's just... That's a caution, again, as we go forward in, in the degree to which um, standards get really articulated in very particular ways, and then if those particular um, specifications were to be included into statute. So I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave this conversation with, um, with a kind of maybe a two-part proposal um, for moving the conversation along and double back to where I started, which was to point out what are the you know, fundamental differences between civil uh, detention and criminal incarceration. That as a matter of law, um, civil detention is expressly not intended for punishment. That, that DHS and ICE in particular is expressly not authorized to punish but merely to hold as necessary for the purpose of the decision of relief or removal. And, um, and so if we start with this basic premise 
it seems to me it should be this at a minimum, and that's clearly what it is, that if there was going to be one standard, that the standard would be that the way in which government, the way in which we, the people of the government, interact um, and oversee the alien population subject to removal is in a, in a manner that results in conditions that are no less than are currently afforded 40 years of case history later to the criminally detained. And that in and of itself is an appreciable improvement over what we have seen in many of the seven buckets, particularly in an area like healthcare, where historically treatment, even assessment to make the determination of treatment, has been predicated in large measure on the anticipated likelihood and time to removal. That is vastly different than the criminal system, where if medical care or medical assessment to determine medical care appears to be necessary, it must be provided. And I can tell you in New York City and every other system I ran, it was always provided, separate and apart from whether or not that person was going to be paroled next week or, quite frankly, executed the next day. So it's kind of a funny place to start. Another way, perhaps, to say that is that the civilly detained should, their, that their detention or their supervision in the community should be the same as, or better, modulated again to what those core assumptions are going to be, and that the core assumption of command and control is not necessarily excluded as a matter of law, but in many instances is clearly not warranted. So what do you think? <laughs> Up to you. So we do have time for a couple of questions, if uh, you're interested in taking a couple of questions. Any questions from the audience? Yeah. Jora, so, can you comment on the, the changes that you were involved in Thank you. Um, yeah. So, and it's a it's a great way to give another example about the differences between how the field of corrections would approach it from how ICE approached it. There's a lot of literature in the corrections arena, and I don't necessarily believe that it is going to apply to the civil side, and so it's a place that really begs for research for all of you thinking about what you're going to do for your dissertation. Um, the, you would make this assessment about what is the likelihood of a person's failure to appear, as I indicated, which would then, that assessment of risk coupled with an assessment of their needs. So what needs did they have that if they were not adequately addressed could then spike their, their risk of um, absconding? And, um, and so the, supervi the decision whether or not to supervise, separate and apart from the decision to release, would be guided by those objective assessments, which are pretty reliable. And, um, and the level of supervision would be no greater than was warranted to achieve the desired result, which is the, the timely reporting as required. And there's been a lot of more recent research that shows that when you over-supervise or over-serve an individual with lower risk or need, that the likelihood of failure increases. Go figure. Who th everyone thought you know, more was better? Not necessarily. Likewise, if you under-supervise or underserve a high-need, high-risk individual, their likelihood of failure also is greater. So it's the Goldilocks. You've got to do it just right. And those assessments, periodic, is the way to do that. ICE had created um, uh, three variations. Um, they had intensive supervision. They had a lesser supervision. Um, both of them were uh, involved with electronic monitoring, which is 
references my earlier comments about an over-reliance on command and control. And, uh, and then they created a, an in-house version. But rather than assign people to programs based on, a, on the assessments that I was just describing, it was driven almost wholly by geography, that there were certain 50 and 85 mile radiuses from which certain services were available and so if they determined at that time without the benefit of assessment instruments that you were going to be placed on community supervision, you got whatever that catchment area had, whether or not it was too much or not enough. And so again, to talk about you know, um, averting risk and things of that sort, there were better ways to have done it. And, uh, and to um, ICE's credit, one of, uh, and one of my recommendations was that just as the case in corrections where we have such assessment instruments that we needed to create an assessment instrument for ICE so that every individual who was eligible as a matter of law could get full and fair consideration as to whether or not placement in the community um, was, um, was a, a good decision and then also to inform that decision about the level of supervision. Uh, now, at the time that I was there, we had selected a new vendor. There was, uh, there was um, a challenge to the award, and so it was delayed for some period of time. I, I'm going to have to turn to you and others to fill in some of the blanks. I believe it's been, I, I think the, that vendor ultimately uh, received, the, uh, uh, received the award, uh, and it appears that there's uh, uh, I think a, great, a, a marginally greater number of people on community supervision uh, now than at the time that uh, I was at ICE. I've read in a recent report it was up 27%, but in real numbers I think that's just a couple thousand folks. Um, um, so that, that assessment instrument um, you know, creates an opportunity to, um, to give greater consideration um, from what I understand, one of the debates in Congress today is if, or de a debate between government and Congress, I guess, is because ICE is funded to operate a certain number of beds a day, must it always operate that many beds? In the corrections world, we cheer when the need for incarceration goes down, and if we can close facilities, we do. Um, and we have, we have closed fac facilities in New York City jail system, we have closed facilities in New York State system, and where people can be shifted to lesser forms of supervision, that's the direction in which corrections is going. Now that's a pendulum that swings back and forth, but the direction nationally that it's going is, is the least restrictive setting um, based on, on the evidence. Does that pretty much touch on what you were looking for, or did I skip anything? You know, I'll tell you, um, my thinking on this has really changed. Um, the private sector is there to make money. And, um, and the way that they make money fundamentally is to figure out what the customer wants and to keep the customer happy. So um, ICE right now, uh, and this is something that I talked about at length in my report. Thank you for, for raising it because it's an important point. ICE needs to continue to create capacity within its own organization. Um, because whether ICE relies on sheriff's departments or the private prisons, and I'll hasten to say that they frequently become the same thing. Because even as you see in Kearns, it's technically an intergovernmental agreement between ICE and the sheriff's department, but the sheriff subs to the private sector who then builds and operates the facility. The sheriff gets, you know, uh, a piece and, um, and there you go. So ICE, you know, ICE had some good instincts. They, they knew that they didn't have 
the right number of people with the right kinds of skills. So, every, But everything they do then is contracted out. So if you don't have the in-house expertise, how do you even know how to write the RFP to get the correct scope of services? How do you know that you picked the right vendor? How do you know that, that the vendor is doing everything that you intended them to? When you get the reports from the vendors, do you have the expertise in-house to evaluate those reports independently to know whether or not they're really responsive to your informational needs, to your statutory obligations, and to the, you know, to the four corners of the, of the contract. Um, so um, this, this, is a, this, is, this is the thing that ICE needs to do. Um, and, the, and in my view, the sheriff's departments and the private sector are going to be there until this capacity is created within ICE so that it can do it by, it, by itself, for itself, or, um, or with greater information, pick individuals or organizations that could do it uh, more, to, more to what they have in mind.